welcome back. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And it's Friday afternoon. So we're going to pump ourselves up and we're going to get through this wonderful, wonderful session. <laughs> Okay, so I may make some adjustments depending on your eye contact, because it is Friday. But uh, today we're going to talk about liberal philosophy and conservative case practice, achieving service equity on disproportionality in child welfare. Many times we talk the talk, but our practice and policies don't reflect liberalism. Okay, and just briefly, we want to establish the goals, and you have to establish what goals you, will, you have for yourself. Today, I want to impart information for you to take into consideration if you're uh, either an intervention person or a policy person or an administrator. Many of the things that we'll talk about clearly are from a theoretical standpoint, but it's food for thought, and a lot are not right or wrong answers but it's something that is proposed in order to begin our discussion. We'll look very briefly, since some of you have been here before, about child welfare trends. We'll talk about cultural competence in child welfare, theory we already talked about, um, and examine family systems theory and how all of that is connected to some intervention strategies. We'll look at cultural patterns in the United States. Uh, we'll talk about different cultures, and some of you will be also facilitating the discussion because everyone's going to have a part um, about their own culture. And we'll look at cultural stereotypes uh, related to race, class, and gender because many times that is the basis of cultural incompetence. And what are some of the implications and then just come to some closure. So this will be pretty interactive. At times I may sit down. Oh, here's the thing, okay and move around, okay? So, let's begin talking about, let's do something, and we're gonna dance. Now, I had thought we would dance in the back, but now I'm thinking maybe we should dance in the front. Hmm? Well, I need you all in the line, because this is a line dance. <laughs> Let's see. Pork? You know it's not going to. Maybe if we move, huh? No, I need some room. There was, it won't work that way. May, we move that to the back, to the front. But maybe if we move this table, just move it back for a second. OK? And then I want everyone to come up to the front and line up shoulder to shoulder. I'm sorry. I should have. I realized that the camera guy. Just we just need some room up here. You want these back too? Yes, please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Well, no one said I was an engineering major or anything like that. <laughs> just push it back a little bit. Okay. All right. Okay, we, well, I think we'll have some room. If you can line yourself up across here. Get so the straight. As far as you can go. Okay? Go on. <laughs> okay, now. Whew, I'm moving this stuff back, back, back. Should have had this set up. Ooh. This, I do just need room. Because you're going to be walking forward. Yeah, here, let's see if we can do that. Thank you. This is collectivism. Yes, please. We'll just move it. And it's not the organizer's fault. Should have, yeah, there you go again. Duh. <laughs> here. I hope we don't drop that. Okay. All right. Yeah, that'll be good. Woo. And we can, and then in the afternoon, we can relax a little bit. Okay, push a little bit. Okay, this is good. Now, 
in the interest of space limitations, I want you, I'm going to ask you a question. And I'll uh, tell you either to step forward or step back. OK? And yeah, this is a little bit. Now, when we say step, for those of us who are vertically challenged, <laughs> or advantage, don't take advantage. Just take a little step. A step will be little, either forward or backward. OK, because I want uh, everyone, let me move that over a little bit. So everybody, get close. It's OK. No one's going to bite you. I'm not, not going to ask you to do anything freaky or anything like that, <laughs> hopefully. All right. This is the dance of structural inequality. <laughs> OK, if you are male, take a step forward. Just a little bit. Now, you just go back since you're ahead of the game anyway. <laughs> OK, there you go. All right. If you have ever attended a private school, take a step forward. If you or anyone in your immediate family has emigrated from another country, take a step back. If English is not your first language, take a step back. If you grew up with a set of encyclopedias in your home, take a step forward. OK. That also showed your age. If you have a <laughs> if, you, if you have had a computer for more than 15 years, take a step forward. 15, OK. If you were raised in a home with two parents, take a step forward. If you are married, take a step forward. If you are a person of color, take a step back. Oh. Yeah, see how? <laughs> this is, she went. That's how she, she, see how she did? She was like. <laughs> if you were raised in a home with a front and backyard, take a step forward. OK. If you've ever been without health care, take a step back. If you own your own car, take a step forward. That doesn't mean a rental or anything like that. If either of your parents has attended college, take a step forward. If you are or working full time while attending college, take a step back. OK. Yes. If you lived in a dormitory, take a step forward. If you belonged to two or more student organizations while attending college, take a step forward. Okay. If you attended a suburban high school, take a step forward. Okay. Now, if it took you more than if it took you five years or more to complete your bachelor's degree, take a step back. <laughs> <laughs> They was getting a little cocky. You see how? Yeah, they thought that I'm ahead of the class. If you were to older than 25 when you completed your undergraduate degree, take a step back. If you were older, okay. If your parents took you to visit two or more colleges prior to your final choice, take a step forward. Okay. If you are 65 years of age or older, take a step back. Or if you're under the age of 21, take a step back. OK. If you are physically challenged, take a step back. If you are of any faith other than Christianity, take a step back. If Now, this is where self-disclosure is important and honesty. If you are pretty or handsome and thin, take a step forward. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK. If you are gay, lesbian, transsexual, take a step back. OK, let's see where we're at. The dance of social inequality. Who's all in the front? You looking around, there's nobody else around. <laughs> what are you looking for? <laughs> 
Okay, we're, <laughs> now this is very unusual. What is your name? Ra Rarity. Rarity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh? There wasn't room. There wasn't room. Yes, but you would have been obviously a few steps towards. Now we don't have any white males here, but generally white males are at the at the uh, uh, beginning of the uh, line. Now you people in the back, what's up? <laughs> we have one, two, three, four women, one male, one, two, three, four persons of color. You just escaped? I escaped? Yeah. Escaped the back row. No, I, I stepped up when uh, you said that you were staying in the house. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Very good. Have a seat. Okay. Yeah. Let's move these back. Thank you. <laughs> that was the. That's um... interesting because women are much harder on themselves. Oh, no, not So, see, you've benefited. You've benefited. Okay. Can everyone. And you can just structure your chairs whichever way you like. Okay. Give yourselves a hand. You did a good job with that. See, it wasn't that bad of a dance. <laughs> you thought you were going to get up and do the electric slide. <laughs> but you can see just that's good. From those social descriptors and social variables, where you end up in life has very much to do with things that you don't have any control over. Very much so. Now it's unusual, so you got to thank mom because she's broken through barriers to get you up at the at the top. Did you ever think of yes? Oh, you moved. Think about those. <laughs> Uh, those kinds of ideas or things, because many times we take them for granted. Yes. Like the one about the front yard and the backyard, I always find that funny. But then when you think about it, mm -hmm. that is an indicator of class, mm -hmm. socioeconomic class, very much so. And I never, and I, I took it for granted. Right. Who right. Now more and more people are in uh, circles that give them a step back, such as single parenting, right? Um, how long it takes you to get through college, right? Visitation, how many times you visited, that's all a part of class and so on. And that's what we're going to talk today about. We're going to talk about social inequality and how even when we have liberal ideas, the social inequality will manifest itself in ways that render us culturally incompetent and really has um, significance uh, in terms of very conservative case practice. Now, I'm trying to look at the crowd. Most of you have been here, so I'm going to skip over the next two slides because it just talks about, that's where we just did that. It talks about um, child welfare, and we know that um, Ethnic minority children have the worst outcomes in child welfare. That they're more likely to be removed. They stay in care longer. So we're talking child welfare is primarily blacks and Hispanics. OK. That's the, the color of child welfare. Dorothy Roberts, University of Chicago, wrote a book, Color of Child Welfare. Color of Child Welfare is primarily black and Latino families. And it's unusual, or I guess curious. You're curious about it because of all of the helping professions, child welfare is supposed to be made up of those gung-ho, uh, do-good social workers, the warriors, the agents of change, uh, the voice of the underdog, you know. So why do we have these problems, disparity, racism? Yes? The handcuffs. The handcuffs? Handcuffs. You know, I, may, I may want to come in with the illusion that I'm going to do a lot of great oh, things for my okay. people, 
once I get on the inside, I find out the politics. I find out, oh, no, 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 I don't want to get that. We don't need that here. Right. And uh, if you think about you're going to implement change, that's when the fight starts. Okay. Who are you to come in? Have been here two days. Right, because we've been here. We know. Uh, Sit down. Yes. Either do it our way. Very good. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that. So now I got to get a visual of handcuffs. Well, and aren't a lot of the assumptions and definitions of um, ideal childbearing and things like that based on particular mainstream class idea of how you're supposed to raise children? Yes. You knew my slide, my next slide. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have to talk about where do these practices and policies come from? And we're going to go very quickly through the historical relevance of an influence of culture on service delivery, serv social services, education, and child welfare. Because I believe there was someone here from education. If I, yes, OK, yes. Because you have been infected as well, okay, so to speak. When we think about. Uh, the history of how culture has taken part in those three arenas. Early history of education in the United States, uh, the early history of how we're socialized in the United States came from a very northern European cultural standpoint. Okay, And you have to emphasize northern European because southern Europeans were excluded as well. Okay, um, That the standard was set by Northern, Europe, Northern Europeans. So many of you, and I don't know, again, I'm trying to get used to, I'm going to turn this way, this is so much better, get used to, uh, I guess, West Coast. But uh, on the East Coast, uh, very um, difficult history uh, stories, historical stories of how Southern Europeans were excluded from mainstream America and how assimilation was the only way that they could survive. For instance, changing your name, dropping syllables in your name so that your ethnic identity becomes ambiguous, like you're nondescript. Um, people who may have been named Sturdivant Inski, <laughs> just use that. You drop the Inski and you become Sturdivant so that you can Get a job, get housing, and so on. Huh? Yes, yes, very much. So. Yes, uh, because there were um, there was a struggle to make sure that a certain culture set the bar, set the standard for life, how we define life. There were some other things that happened in social services, education, and child welfare that indigenous people were clearly. Um, seen as a barrier to the move to be, have people Americanized. So one time while the Eastern Seaboard was heavily populated by indigenous folks, many things occurred in order to get Native Americans further and further away from the Eastern Seaboard. Some of it was physical moves, others were social policies, as well as uh, physical annihilation of folks. There is a city, or I guess it would be a city, in Pennsylvania, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which has historical relevance because they would send large groups of Native American children there to de-Indianize them in schools. They would remove them from their tribes, from their families, send them to Carlisle. Jim Thorpe is a product of uh, was a product of uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Well. The children weren't, aside from being removed uh, forcibly from their uh, families, they weren't allowed to practice their culture. Uh, they did things like shave their heads. You know, they weren't allowed to wear their hair in their cultural tradition, stripped of their clothing, put in Western clothing, weren't allowed to eat their food, and so on to American, weren't allowed to speak their language, weren't allowed to Americanize, weren't allowed to be Indian. They had to be American, whatever that meant. And uh, the stories are profound. Some children succumbed physically, died. So we know the importance of culture. They could not survive. 
And then there were uh, people who came here either voluntarily or involuntarily, such as African slaves, Asians who were brought here to work, um, to do the work of railroads, and also there were, um, blacks weren't the only slaves as well. Others were enslaved here in America. But it brought a mix of America, mix of people here to America in order to develop it economically, okay? Diversity was not embraced necessarily because of uh, just an altruistic feeling of love, okay? <laughs> it had an economic purpose, all right? All right. So uh, what do you do when there's such a mixture of folks? When we begin to talk about the education of minority groups and working with folks in social service, uh, dominant models of intervention that are still taught today in schools of social work, say Jake, uh, Jane Addams, Jacob Reese, come from a very northern European cultural standpoint. In fact, every school of social work still teaches some of those uh, ideals about the definition of family, uh, uh, appropriate educational strategies, et cetera. Now, in the 19th century, people started to, they had started to look at uh, what it meant to be urbanized, that the country was changing. And because of industrialization, people started to look at what impact did the Industrial Revolution have on families. So you have large people coming into uh, the shores of America, large urban areas, industrial centers, and then a mixture of people. How does this impact the functioning of the family? And a, a discipline known as family sociology was uh, created. Now it's important because at the same time in these industrial centers, there was a philosophical belief of social Darwinism. And social Darwinism is uh, analogous to the uh, biological theory that those who survive or rise to the top are the fittest, the survival of the fittest. The strongest will survive. And in order to keep the population raw, uh, going, the strongest have to maintain themselves in that uh, superior position. Many industrialized cities, such as Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, were uh, foundations of social Darwinism. You know, the movers and the shakers would sit around and talk about social Darwinistic philosophy, that the reason there were wealthy people and poor people was because of survival of the fittest, that those who were the brightest, the best, the m better equipped to lead, wrote, naturally rose to the top, genetic basis. Uh, that's why we have many libraries and museums. It wasn't necessarily that, wouldn't this be nice to give to the people? It was the belief, very paternalistic belief, that while you may never get to my level, because you can't, I have a responsibility to get you to the highest level possible, to expose you to the arts, to literature, okay, to sort of civilize common man. Right. And education, uh, social work, et cetera, believe the same, that minority families were studied but because they had to meet a certain standard, minority families were seen as sick versions of white standards, white northern standards. And this was due to, even when they said it nicely, their deficient standard or way of life was due because of poverty and discrimination. Okay. And you can see many of these uh, very uh, classical um, researchers would come up with this idea of, and kind of quite recently, come up with ideas of examining families, minority families, against white middle class standards. Because of those standards and research, many um, studies were published, 
and uh, many ideas about how to affect what was the problem and what, how to effectively work with these families uh, came about. Minority family research is the most widely uh, research field and African American families is one of the most widely researched field. However, most of the research that has been done on minority families has been done from a deficit based path pathological to see what's wrong. Okay, and even minority researchers, classical minority researchers, much of, much of their early research was on the pathology of minority families. Okay. Now, why was that? Was that just by happenstance? For those of us who are conspiracy theorists, that was a joke again, <laughs> that what is in the literature, what is in the philosophy, the practice, is the word, right? Once it's written and taught, then it becomes legitimate. So why is there this deficit-based uh, literature on minorities because it's not just previous but it's a, it's current and this is by Wade Nobles it's a control mechanism he who controls the information controls and therefore the most efficient way to keep minority people oppressed and powerless is to provide society with ideas which justify and certify the inferior status and condition of minority people it's purposeful. When you feed the information that the reason there are achievement gaps because of deficient neighborhoods, deficient school systems, children who do not have the capacity to learn, it's self-fulfilling. Okay. Why are there so many men in technical or scientific fields? Hmm? No. Right, they're better in math, right? No. And where did that come? Yeah, I'm, I'm here to rile your anger. Up. <laughs> so, okay, yes. Yes, because that's what's fed in, that by virtue of being female, you don't have those capacities. No, I, do, I don't believe that. I think that women just equal in math. But because the higher up they go, they go in math, they see that they don't need two of them. They want to two of them around, so they... Oh, absolutely. It's, it's an that's, yes, it's an assumption. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. yes, that's what we're saying. Because right, men are better at math, so that's why they're in right. the science and right. mathematics field. And women are naturally nurturing, so that's why we go into social services. Okay, and not a lot has changed because even now with uh, liberation and advocacy, uh, university classrooms, you can look very much gender imbalanced. But it's Engin not just, but it's huh? not deliberately, and they, they, they want to make sure that males get all the necessary tools and resources and mentorships that they need to further them into those, um, um, in those uh, arenas of education. Sure. I know a gentleman that's sitting now um, a physics. He gets a master's in physics on his PhD. So I said, well, how did you get that? He's been nourished from a little bit. Yes. And very um, subliminal things or minor things. If you just want to talk a little bit about TV and stuff, but the toys that we give boys and girls. And even more now, I see these, oh, these commercials with these toys of, uh, for little girls of the, uh, you know, you would think we have moved beyond uh, Barbie and, you know, the dress up or whatever. And I have feelings about Barbie. Uh, <laughs> Barbie should be incarcerated. Incarcerated? Like, little boys and little girls? What? Like, um, what, the way we treat them, you know, so like little boy falls, you know, we're like, get up, be a little, you know, yes. be a man, you know, man up. take it, you know, yes. like a little girl falls, we're like, oh, right, you know? right. The little boy can have a concussion. Yeah. Shake it off. <laughs> Shake it off. <laughs> Sounds like my husband. Shake it off, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we a, it off. yeah, there's a gash in his head. Shake it off. Yes. Now, um, and we'll go through because we have some fun things to do. 
In order to understand the structure and functioning of how minority families uh, work, we just can't look at uh, one historical perspective. And uh, certainly we don't want to look just from a social Darwinistic perspective, but we have to look at five different dimensions in order to really understand how we have come to where we are today. We want to look at the historical, ecological, cultural, and you want to solve the problem. It's not enough to identify, but we have to come up with some problem and uh, solution. Now let's just very quickly go through the historical perspective. How do we come to find or come to view what is a family? Okay, And uh, when we look back in uh, time, during the Richard Nixon, the some I know of the young folks, he was a president. Okay. <laughs> Because I always have to remind myself that don't take for granted, you know, that they know, okay? Because I always left uh, JFK, when I do a little thing on that, and they'll say, oh, the guy who died in the airplane crash. Yeah, it's from their perspective. So, no, he had a dad who was like the president, but okay. Um, this was the first time when America got a visual image of what family should look like. And they did uh, presidential debates around a kitchen table, checkered tablecloth, um, you know, gingham curtains, and so on. And so for the first time, because remember the TV is pretty new, and so on, so people saw this image. Oh, is that what my home should look like? Or is that what kitchens should look like? And that is attributed to sta setting the standard of what is a functional family, okay? And we know all of those traditional or, or classic, I should say, uh, TV shows. Leave it to Beaver. Yes, Donna Reed. I don't know how she walked in those heels all day. <laughs> I just don't know how she did that. Yes, Dick Van, and Laura, wasn't she just gorgeous? She was just gorgeous. I always had the latest casual clothing. I mean, just gorgeous, and her hair was always great. Um, and Lucy. I mean, Lucy never had anything laying around in that little apartment because it was just that one room and apparently a bathroom, right? And the kitchen, the kitchen. Yes, the twin bed. She couldn't. Yes. No. And Laura, and um, yes, they don't. They don't. They didn't come together either. They. Uh, so I don't know. And little Richie was never an infant. He just came out as eight years old. But <laughs> I noticed that he just came out. Okay, so we had then the standard, uh, and certainly during the 50s, there was uh, very Americanized, quote, ways of looking. Well, it was during the civil rights movement, the, be the beginning of the civil rights movement, when, uh, and following the Kennedy administration and the uh, uh, Johnson administration when it followed, and Johnson, Lyndon Johnson was the president. Um, after, you know, he came after they killed JFK, the first guy. Okay, just so you know. All right. So, uh, and it depends on where you stand politically, but some people attribute Lyndon Johnson as being one of the most progressive in terms of uh, human rights and civil rights than any other president. You, know? <laughs> you can't. Well, this is, yes. So, but we have to see. Now, I'll. That's to say so you can make your own determination. Anyway, Lyndon Johnson uh, wanted to have some justification for passing social policy reform. And things like uh, welfare, OIC, Head Start, and so on. And he commissioned Patrick Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, to do a study of minority families, black families in America, to see what their family lifestyles were, what were the problems, what were the cultural perspectives, and so on. And uh, Moynihan went out and did this extensive report, which came to be known as the Moynihan Report, the uh, very classic Moynihan Report. And what Moynihan came up with was, well, yes, there is justification for social reform and that the government should provide funding in order to uplift the African-American uh, community because they are deficient 
their families are deficient. And they're deficient be simply because of discrimination and racism. Okay? They have a deficient lifestyle that does not help them navigate through America's social system. Well, the Urban League, the National Urban League, and others were incensed by the Moynihan Report. How dare you? And reading that, it's such a very deficit base, a presumptive kind of a report. Well, they said, you know, thank you, Lyndon Johnson, but we'll get our own report, okay? And they commissioned a young uh, sociology scholar by the name of Robert Hill. And Robert Hill was a student of Andrew Billingsley. And uh, he went out and, of course, uh, reviewed the Moynihan Report extensively and also came back in, uh, with his concept or analysis of the report. And he said, you know, Moynihan may have been accurate with the data, but the interpretation was incorrect. Because, again, he interpreted the data from a cultural standpoint outside of the culture that was studied. It wasn't culturally uh, relative, and it was from a very deficit base. So Robert Hill, when he did his study, he found out the same thing that Moynihan found, except instead of deficiencies or weaknesses, he saw these things as strengths. He said that Moynihan missed the mark. And as a result of that, he published a book called The Strengths of African American uh, Families. And when he came up with these um, strengths, we'll talk about them later, that people began to see African American families differently. Okay. But nonetheless, the Moynihan Report had a significant uh, impact on how we view families. And uh, from the Moynihan Report, many, many studies started uh, to look at African-American families, uh, Hispanic and Latino families, Native American families. And it went through several different phases of, of, of research. And there were phases of research that looked at families from a very primitive family life uh, form that we uh, looked at Native American families as very either patriarchal, matriarchal, monogamous, or polygamous. And that this was not the way of mainstream America. Uh, between 1800 and 1900, the 1900s, life conditions of uh, modern families was again affected by the move to it being an industrialized uh, nation. So how cities were impacting the life, so psychosocial development of folks was being examined. Then we moved to the 20s, where family life was looked at uh, and how more people were able to live, quote, a middle class lifestyle. Okay, how could we compare people um, to what is the standard according to that particular uh, ideal? Also, it was the roaring 20s and sexual uh, behaviors and so on was looked at. And what was considered normal and abnormal was also determined during that time. That 20 sounded like an interesting time to live. Um, and again, here we go with uh, academic understandings when they began to say, maybe we should start studying black people. And both uh, people indigenous to the culture and outside of the culture began to study black family life. Many of these texts are still in print and uh, have provided the basis for study. Um, during World War II, so on, uh, Korean War, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, research in family uh, theory. But when we moved, um, phase six is the last phase, it began to look at, wait a minute. Moynihan was wrong, um, rainwater, kind of shaky. Let's look to see what are the actual facts rather than the myths. And people began to look at 
how the unequal distribution of resources in the United States might have an impact on family functioning. They began to look at the idea of racism that actually exists in the United States or existed in the United States versus the melting pot uh, syndrome. And they looked at how such policies, social conditions, are they orchestrated to annihilate, to eliminate certain groups. Okay, uh, all of you are familiar with things like the uh, Tuskegee studies, okay, research, research during that time, there wasn't any ethical standards, so they just went and did all kinds of research, and that was, that's the one that is primarily quoted, but there were hundreds of research projects that they did that no one ever held, was ever held accountable you know, injecting people with all kinds of things, not providing medical care uh, to see what the effect of the debilitation of disease and so on um, was done. So when we think about the study of ethnic minority life, it's primarily been a comparative analysis uh, from minority to middle class white, okay? It's been an existential experience and analysis. Now, we need to move on beyond those historical understandings or beliefs. And um, when we start thinking about why that's important, and this slide is a little old, we can see where people settled in the United States. Okay, and the ancestry, because whoever is the dominant culture has a lot to do with setting the standard around public policy, okay, health care, education, and so on. Now, California, the ancestry is primarily Mexican, right? Mm -hmm. United States. Uh, no, 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 right there. It says the so that the orange color. Oh, the American. Those are the real people. <laughs> I should say white and, you know, the um, English. Yes, you see? British Isles. Yes. Oh, it's the middle side. Yes. It's a particular. It wouldn't be your. Um, that's just different from the white right. Yes. It wouldn't include um, Poland. It wouldn't include Italy. Yes, no. Okay. Oh, that's, that's an accurate description. They would never say that, but that's an accurate, accurate description. Yes. And they also don't really have an English or Irish identity anymore, whereas in Still, so yes, so awesome. very much. And it sets the tone of the culture of the, of the community, very much. <clears throat> now, when we look at United States ethnic groups, we can see that we're still primarily a white, uh, whatever that may mean. Um, African Americans still represent about 12, 13% of the population. Uh, Hispanic Americans, Hispanic Latinos are rising, and it's projected that they will rise above, be the largest ethnic minority group. And of course, clumping all Asians together is still a very low percentage. Okay, but we should, must be, uh, need to be more descriptive because you know how we do. Now, this is what's projected, however, by the year 2100, that um, the rise in Hispanic Latino populations and this is numerically, um, will uh, continue past African American and uh, Asian uh, communities. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and for the Latino, Hispanic, that is not breaking out race. Race. Okay. Yes. That's so, um, I think, were we talking about that yesterday? So interesting. Because and again, you guys have much more experience, but on the East Coast, 
it's often difficult to people, for people to understand. I'll speak for my agency, that you can be Hispanic and not white. You see what I mean? And because I, I look at our data, and I says, this doesn't seem accurate to me. And then when you say, well, how do you determine the race of the, of the child? And I said, well, I looked at them. You know, in this country, unfortunately, we still look at people and determine race. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, with the Asian population, I think that they're going to have an a, a impact in America. But it's going to be like future, uh, you know, in, in, in the very, you know, way, way future. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening now is Latino, I mean, Asian women are coming to, they're talking to L.A. and they're having children. And then they're going back. So I figure, like, they're, they're, those kids will be able to come back, you know, educated, come here, and they'll be able to step right on back in America and mm -hmm. give them a nice little flush job. So that's what's happening with this. And I see the numbers are going to be maybe not as high as the Latinos, but they'll be back on their backs. Right. And I think it's important to note that numerical um, advantage doesn't necessarily mean social advantage. Because you may still have a, uh, for instance, if we look at gender, women outnumber men, but we don't have the political, social, economic advantage. So minority status is really your, the degree to which you um, are able to exert political, social, economic power. Right? Okay. So it's, I'm just saying that not to get um, sometimes uh, get confused with uh, the number. It's still who's holding the power. Right? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so because of this change in America, we have to certainly talk about cultural competence. We all know what cultural competence is, or do we? And this is just a working definition. It's the ability of people of one culture to understand, communicate, operate, and provide effective services to people cross-culturally. And it involves uh, the following. Professional behavior that avoids racist or discriminatory pr practices, providing services to people of different culture, being sensitive to linguistics. I tell people all the time that speaking louder does not mean that they will understand you. Um, and it's also an indication of the state of cultural health. Yes. That, uh, to look, yes. Religion, class, and so on. That we hear, you know, just horrific things. I was at a uh, conference of child welfare administrators and we were sitting outside after the conference on a patio, a veranda, and a um, few, couple of us were sitting, three of us were sitting at one table and there was a large table uh, similar to this of, of folks. And so we're eating and you know, everyone's having their little conversation. So all of a sudden I heard the word nigger. I said, oh no. So three of us at the table, we just, you know, just okay, stopped a little bit and just kept eating because surely we didn't hear that, and we didn't say anything to each other. And then we heard it again. So we said, "Is this the land of Oz or what?" You know. <laughs> so I looked over to the table, and the way the tables were situated, some people with their back to me didn't know that I was sitting there and. Some people were facing me so they could see me. And I thought, and I know them, you know, I thought, well, maybe there will be a response. No response. And the person who said it didn't, wasn't where he was seated, couldn't see me. And he said it again and made some joke. And I thought, do you do now? So I, you know, I gave real specific eye contact to one of what I thought was my colleagues and like, like, what's up, you know? No one ever said anything. And then apparently someone nudged him under the table or something and uh, 
he got up and left. Well, there was a young employee with me, and I guess she had not experienced anything like that before because she immediately began, began to cry. You know, it was just very sad. And uh, myself and another person, we're like, is it, did, this, did that just happen? We just couldn't believe it. And this is like two years ago. Did that just happen? And it, no, it wasn't two years ago. It was uh, during the election. And um, well, that was about two or three years ago, yes. So one of our colleagues, Mel, he had been out and he came in, he was coming in to dinner. So he saw the one person crying, our faces like, you know, he says, what's wrong? What's wrong? And so I said, something horrible just happened. And so he thought, this isn't funny, I hope this doesn't go on the tape, but he, he says, oh my God, did they do something to Obama? <laughs> because it was during the... Oh. Uh, <laughs> He said, he couldn't imagine why we were so upset. I says, no, it wasn't that bad. But so we, I says, let's go down to the pool. Because I didn't want his reaction right then, because I, I know this person. And we went down to the pool. And we just, you know, we talked about what happened. He couldn't believe it. Well, I went to the head of the, uh, conference, per, uh, the conference and explained what happened. But she had already heard about it. Yes. Um, and I said, you know, I'm not, we're not naive to know that people used to have those values, those ideas, use that language. But the fact that we're child welfare administrators, what implication does that have for the families that we work with? And no one, no one stood up to the plate and says, hey, you're out of line. Stop. So when you're complacent, you know, with it, um, you're just as guilty. And to this, and I, did some other things afterward, but we'll talk about that later. But no one has ever come to me and apologized, said, you know, yeah, very disappointing. So um, clearly that's not professional behavior. Now, in order to develop cultural competency in child welfare, these are just some very basic, and everyone knows this, you know, do your research, do your homework, know something about the, peop the, the population you want to know, don't try to be the expert. Um, my husband always says, I hate when people give me those multiple handshakes. <laughs> you know, like that's going to connect. Like, I don't do that. So why? Yeah. He says, I got to keep up with the, what, what's the handshake you're talking about? Um, <laughs> respect and follow the expected behavior of the group. Gain admission. Sometimes you have to use others to do that. And build relationships with people in the community. Um, and if you're learning something, give back. It's not just a matter of give, taking in information. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, here, we're going to go through this because I want to get to our exercise. I guess I don't have enough heat in my body to move this down. Now, when we think about the culture, what is the culture of the United States? We all come from different cultures, uh, ethnic cultures, or, uh, uh, and different races. But there is a specific value in the United States. And when we think about uh, the culture of the United States, a researcher by the name of Williams came up with 10 core values and beliefs about culture in the United States. And these are some of the things that we all embrace. We embrace equal opportunity, achievement, and success, material comfort, we know we like that. We like work. We like to keep active. It's hard for us to just sit because we think like we're just wasting time. Uh, practicality and efficiency. Whenever you have a fully made hot dog and a little package that you can microwave, that's practicality and efficiency. I mean, how much more does it take? How much faster do you want that hot dog? <laughs> okay. We um, value progress, science, democracy, and free enterprise, freedom, and racism. Those are our core values. Okay. Now, when we think about um, families, we tend to come from the perspective that in the helping professions 
that we only work with a person. But when we're understanding families, we have, thank you, we have to understand the families, children come from families and families are interconnected. This is a real brief analysis of family systems theory. That once, um, we have a person that we're working with. Family system looks at families as a system. It's a connected working part, like a mobile. So when one part of the mobile moves, the entire mobile moves. The family is greater than the sum of its parts. Okay? All members are connected and there's a relationship, whatever that may be, but that relationship will affect one member of the family. So if we're talking about how do we um, work with people, work with particularly people from minority groups, policies have to reflect family work and not individual work. Okay. Now what I want you to do next um, is get out, we're going to make, um, we're going to have a little bit of a exercise. Why do people do the things they do? <laughs> Why do people behave and perceive and perform the way they do? Part of beliefs. What did you say? Learned. They, it's learned behavior. Okay. Environment. Um, why could Michael Jackson dance so good? Why? <laughs> See, I was turned here because I was going to moonwalk with my <laughs> <laughs> Discipline. Okay. That was a gift for me. Gift. Family. Okay. Just gifted. Where's that gifted? And he worked hard. You're not going to moonwalk. Okay. When we try to answer that question, what accounts for performance, not only of individuals, okay, but large groups of people? outcomes. There are two basic theories that answer that question. The first group of theories are known as biogenic theories. The reason that Mike, because I felt like I knew him personally, I did. I really did. <laughs> See, Mike had been with me. Mike would have been alive today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's examine Mike or whoever. To understand that person, the reason Michael Jackson could dance so much is because he inherited certain characteristics, biologically inherited predisposition. There was something in Mike that made him the superior artist that he was. That's a group of theories, okay? Does that hold water for all African American men? Okay. Hmm? No. So you're saying because it's not true for you. Right. Okay. When you talk about individual differences, biogenic theories have some validity. You know, because some are, some are, things are inborn talent. Okay. And I was very much opposed to biogenic theories. You know, fought very much against them, argued, debated, and so on. Because uh, in psycho psychology circles, people buy into biogenic theories. But what explains whole groups of people? Can't hold water, right? So the second, and by the way, biogenic theories have sold big books. Uh, because they go from 
not only like motor abilities, but cognitive abilities. The uh, bell curve mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was a book, Murray, that said certain people are smarter than others because of biological predisposition. Certain races are smarter, right? Okay. Have different capacities, so we should gear education around capacities based on race. Well, you know who, who was at the bottom. Hmm. Rarity would have been a rarity for you. To, <laughs> yes, okay? Well, the second group of theory says, you know what? In order to understand Michael, you have to look at parts of his environment. And let's look at the first one, his family. His, that's microsystem. People who are closest to him have the most intimate and long-lasting relationships with him, okay? How you interact with the organism or the individual between the microsystemic variables, how they interact with that individual has an impact on their perceptions and their behavior. Suppose Michael had been born to another family. He may not have developed to the person that he was. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Birth order. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Now, Michael. Um, the next layer we would look at Michael's mesosystemic variables or his environment, the neighborhood, okay, where the family existed. Where do you think that principle of hard work came from? Okay. Think about his family, yes. Whatever we think about his father and his mother, very hard working people, right? So when you see one working, his father worked in the steel mills. See one working and still more work, trust me, from East Coast. It's hard work. Men put in 10, 12 hours a day, back-breaking work. Uh, and you do that and then come home and then go to your other job. Okay. So how the family existed, and the family grew up, Michael grew up in Gary, Indiana, where he didn't see just his father doing that, but other families doing that. So that idea of hard work um, certainly came uh, from mesosystemic variables and other things. Then we're going to spend some time talking about the next uh, group, and that's exosystemic variables. How do you come to define who you are is defined as from society, what society tells you. Now, what did Michael look like when he was in Detroit and Gary, Indiana? Huh? He was little and brown. And little and brown, and, right? Mm -hmm. Then he went to Hollywood. Mm. What happened to Mike? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What'd you say? Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was obviously influenced by what standards of beauty? were, right? Mm. So how you begin to define yourself comes from external forces. And we'll talk about media forces and how that influences. Macro systems are social institutions in the, not, the United States. And finally, chronosystemic events. And we talked about that earlier, um, Ma'afa experiences and so on. Okay, those are life-altering events. Now. Okay, let's look at this part of uh, theory on how we come to define others. And what I want you to do, um, and after you're done with this exercise, I want you to take your break and come back. But what I want you to do is um, you're going to go into groups. And let me see, I guess you can go into a couple groups, groups of three or, or whatever. But before um, we do that, I'm going to, is there a, yes, magic marker. 
that is new and I can't open. What I want you to do, don't worry. No, I can work, write it down. You know, at rarity, you can be my, my, you rip it. That's okay. I don't want you to. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. You haven't been to the airport yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You could just write down. The f okay. The f no, because you're just going to write it on there. Okay. Any color, you pick one, because I'll analyze that. Oh, red. No, no. <laughs> Okay. All right. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, let's say uh, Hispanic women. Write that down. That's all right. Well, staying away from that window is making me nervous too. <laughs> Leave. Lose our child here. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Black men. Uh, Asian men. And let's look at white women. And uh, let's look at uh, gay men. Okay. I'm going to add. Hmm, how many group women say you don't have enough? We can do. Just uh, down here, black women. Okay. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is to, we don't have a whole lot of people, but let's look at these groups of people here. Okay? And I want you to pair off. You can do it probably naturally where you're sitting. You know, at least have three people in your little group. Um, uh, first group, I want you to take Hispanic women. What about, you be... Okay, group one. Okay. You know what? I can give each of you two. How about that? Who, who are your groups? You're bonded back there? You're a group? Okay, you're bonded. And you're bonded there? And then you're, the, you're a group. Okay? Okay, wherever you want to go. Okay, so we have group one, group two, and group three. Group one, I want you to uh, look at Hispanic women and black men. Group two, I want you to do Asian men and white women. Group three, I want you to do gay men and black women. Everyone have that? I know. Group two? Here. No. Who, whoever, who wants to be number one? Okay. Okay, now, what I want you to do is to think about descriptors for each of these groups. By free association, things that describe this group. Things that you have heard and have never said yourself, but things that you might have heard other people say, okay? Um, things that describe the group, or things that how people label the group, or things that first come to mind. Now, be honest with yourself. We're uh, having an exploration here, and I've done this. So if you don't add things, I will say them. Okay? So give. Me, so go ahead and do that. You want to do that after your little break and come back, or you want to take your break now, and then go come back and do this? Yes. Does, I take my break. I do it. Huh? You just want to go straight through? Yeah. OK. All right, because I do. All right, so they have to go potty for a little bit. So just wait. Yeah, you're by yourself. Oh, you know that's a setup. <laughs> no. OK, so go ahead. 
Someone can be recorder because you're going to report out. I've been standing for two days. <laughs> yes, I just figured it out. Why am I so tired? Because I've been standing for, that's OK. All right, well, is everyone? No, it's group one. OK, we'll just, just a second. And let's give a hand to our cameraman back there. He's, uh, he's been working, yes. They have to hear and listen, uh, sit through the stuff for two days. <laughs> you can get. Mm -hmm. yes. so. Yeah, yesterday we had <laughs> social workers, juvenile justice. Annabelle, where are you from? What does. Oh, medical. Okay, I would. The, okay. Okay, your education, right? Yeah, his start, that's right, that's right. And you're from the church? Well, actually, I work in public health. So oh, oh, okay. Okay, oh, really? Church, okay. <laughs> okay, all right, so still have different, and she's international. <laughs> And that's ju juvenile justice, or? Uh, what is it, a uh, community-based? Oh, OK. Oh, wow, OK. OK. We have a little bit of time left to do some work. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. This my an air conditioning. Okay. All right. Is everyone here? Valerie and oh, they're gone. Okay, we need rarity, right? <laughs> You have a beautiful city. Yes, I like beautiful city. Yes, actually, um, Miss Oma Latade took me all over the parts of San Francisco yesterday, and um, gave me a a tour, historical tour. So. Uh, and I haven't seen as much as of Oakland other than down, right down here. No, no. Um, actually, I have some family here that I have to, you know, I have to look up. I shouldn't say it like that. But, uh, I'm looking forward to, yes. Pittsburgh. I'm from Pittsburgh originally. Yeah. But it's uh, different. I'm sort of like in Oakland, mm -hmm. a little bit more than San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this reminds me more of home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. Been across the bay, you know, in San Francisco, in yes, yes. She took me to whatever parts the, of course, you know, I'm analyzing everything the affluent part versus the. Uh, I guess the part to me, it looked more like uh, Manhattan. I sort of like that part. Yeah. The part down by, the, I guess, by the bay. Yeah. I just wonder how people who live there, what kind of jobs do you have to afford that type of lifestyle? And actually, I saw a San Francisco like, um, bunk, and they just have um, built on top of it. And it's like a little bit of a Because you can just buy another boat. Yeah. No biggie. Yeah. yeah. Just kind of roll away one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's supposed to just fall off. Fall off. Then I want to, is it Union? Union Square. 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 Union
Yeah, and I've been kind of, yeah, I've been kind of, you know, I know Bart, you know, I'm on there. I, although yesterday I'm too busy looking around and looking at people and missed the stop. <laughs> but I knew how to get back. Yeah. I think the last time I was here about maybe three years ago, but that was Monterey. Yeah. And I thought, it was so cold. It was freezing. It was just freezing. Yeah, it was just freezing. It was, yes, it was in the middle of the summer and it was cold. Uh, it was cold. I mean, it was cold. And I know cold. I mean, I, I, windy or do you mean cold? It was cold. The coldest summer is a the coldest winter is summer I spent in San Francisco. Yeah, and I went to the little place where he would, I guess, go think Mark Twain, you know, and it was just, I just thought it was cold. Yes, as did the other Pittsburghers who were with me, we thought, this is cold. This is. Okay, so let's um, report out. Who wants to go first? Group one. Okay. That's please. So um, we had gay men and black women, and that um, for gay men, some of our, our verbiage was uh, fairies, punks, stags, pedophiles, and things like that. Um, and for black women, it was like uh, fairies, punks, stags, pedophiles, their culture. Um, oh, I don't remember the song. Sorry, I can't read my handwriting. Feminine, um, drag queens, homo, they're educated, that's a heathen, a lot of drug use, HIV positives, uh, teddy bears. Um, I sort of was saying that, you know, just through friends and stuff that I hear that there's like levels of queendom, so you can be a certain level of gay. Um, recruit, they recruit for their lifestyle. Uh, confused, have like father issues, and molested as children. Lost? Molested. Molested, molested children. Okay. Yes. And molesters. Oh, you said as? Uh, molested as children, but yeah, pedophiles. And pedophiles, yes. Yes. Um, and then for um, black women, excuse me, a big bitch, sisters, overweight, drama queens, gold diggers, poor, incubators. Um, incubators? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, when I hear new ones, I'm always, <laughs> I've not heard baby that one. <laughs> oh, baby makers, okay, that, you just use a different nomenclature, okay. Uh, loose, wild, crazy, emotional, loud, good lover. Loud? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Strong, religious, all about the hair, the nails, the feet, fashion, large and in charge, they're aggressors, they're tenacious, and self-confident. Oh, okay. Now, anyone want to add any? Yeah. That's good. You know, and the whole time we were talking, I kept thinking peepholes. Peepholes? Yeah. That's a new one. Like in bathrooms and different places, they have like holes in the walls, you know, and they have to their glory holes. Glory holes, thank you. Man, you're on your list. Okay, like so if you not, see, this is, because my next question is. <laughs> Are there things that we haven't heard before? Glory, I ain't heard before. I don't know. Where a man will stick his penis into a hole and there's someone or something on the other side. Okay. Which means the service. Yeah. Oh. What bathrooms are you guys going to do? Where are these restrooms? Oh, my God. They had it before. Uh, what's his name? Became mayor, and he like cleaned up all of the. Oh, okay. Uh, no, the one, um, the one who tried to run. <coughs> oh, yeah. He cleaned up New York, and because they had all of the bad uh, press with the tourists and everything, and so they had the, the gory holes in downtown Manhattan, and they had uh, no uh, Italian name. What was it called? Mario. I don't know. It's the other one. He tried to run eleven. The 9-11. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, so Julian. Julian. They're, yes. they're pretty popular though here in Oakland too. Glory Hole? 
And so, how is black women? Yeah, so we're on the game. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. I, was saying, I said, where are we stop doing that? Yeah. Where are we at on the other side of the wall? What's up with that? I didn't know. Okay. Glory whole thing. Okay. But you black women, I think. Y'all, wait. That's what I thought, too. No, 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 sorry. You said people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Primarily positive or negative? Say for gay men. Negative. negative right. Black women. Yeah. Mostly. 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 Mostly negative. Yes. Any like shock? Well, this was a sort of a surprise. It's people. What do you call it? glory hole glory. thing? That was something new to me. I had not. Okay. Any ones that we would add? Baby mama drama? Doesn't matter. Welfare recipient, lazy. Thank you, Yeah, Bitches, hoes, sluts. Hmm? That was first. That was first. first. Oh, that was first. Thank you. I know you're on the mark there. All right. Okay. Next group. Number two. For whoever wants to go. Okay. Asian uh, men. We're only saying Asian. So because you know you can be. Oh, the Vietnamese, Korean. The businessmen, hard workers, financially frugal, educated, racist, opinionated, sexist, old fashioned, and um, you know, recognize high art. Something about high art. Okay. Any ones would we add that we could add? Yeah, I think traditional. Traditionalist, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't think they usually see the things in masculine. Yeah, they're not. Pristine, notwithstanding. Yeah, but I don't think they're pristine. Masculine, yeah. Look at that, man. Small penises, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> not good at math. Good at math. Good at math. They're quiet. Photographers. They're quiet. Quiet, cameras, poor drivers. Quiet, poor drivers. Asian women are poor drivers. Okay. Okay. Any ones we haven't heard before? All right. Okay. What about then white women? White women? I'm sorry. Mostly positive or negative? Mostly positive, right? It's half and half. But stereotypes based on East Asian then? Chinese, Japanese, Korean? It just kind of ignores the Asian women that are Asian. Yes. These are all Asian. It's invisible. Yeah. Yes. Right. I mean, not even as negative stereotypes. They're just invisible. Yes. What? Taxes are all the same. Oh, here? Right. Oh, okay. I have to check that out. Yeah, I mean, that English kind of left out all these things. Okay. Yeah, because then if you were including, like, Indian and parts of the Right, right, right. Yes. Or Asiatic. Right, right. Very good. Okay. Um, they're considered the ideal minority. Okay. Asian. Asian, yes. Asian men. According Asians, to period. Yeah. <laughs> According to America's standard, we tend to use very positive stereotypes. And we'll talk about what a positive stereotype is. It's still a stereotype, OK? Uh, so next was white women. And she's still writing. Uh -oh. I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, power seekers, racist, idealists, selfish, Arrogant, no empathy, spiritual slash religious, kind, homemaker, family oriented. 
any you want to add? Yes. <laughs> okay, no, you got to get angry about it. We just start. <laughs> Those are the scriptures that you've heard. Poor, slut, traitor. That's white. You can't be black and white. Promiscuous. And very loose. Self-absorbed. Self-absorbed. Okay, any, well, I guess we added a, quite a bit here. Self-conscious. They say a lot of white women are self-conscious, whether it be about... Look, right. look thin. to some degree, thin. I was um, telling my group, you know, like my really good friend and I, you know, she's always worried about her hair, but I'm always worried about my weight. So the two things are just together. Yes. Put them. <laughs> They're different, but together. Yes. Know? Put them together, you both are just yeah. at fault. <laughs> yes. Yes. Easy going. Easy going. Yes. Whiny. Come from good families if you're a boy, you know, most of the time you know. Yes. Right. Pretty standard of beauty. Mm-hmm. 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 Very good. Sound. Okay. More well, positive or negative? As we add it to it, it kind of balances. Okay, uh, yes, and it depends on the uh, receiver as well. I mean, the uh, who's doing it. Okay, last group: Hispanic women and black men. Who's that group? Over here. Okay. Okay, for um, Latino women, you said their mothers hardworking, domestics. Um, they don't speak English. They're family oriented. They're like hot, sexy sirens, oppressed by... High, Russia. sexy sirens? <laughs> Is that a t-shirt? <laughs> 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 Put it all together. Oppressed by macho men, judgmental, hyper-feminine, rigid gender roles, religious, indulgent to children, poor. Okay. And then for black men, we said... Oh, were we supposed to... I'm sorry, we're stopping. Yes, then, so... Anything you want to add to Hispanic women? Bossy. Nurturers. Nurturers? Okay. Sexual. Sassy. Sassy. You have to say it right if you're going to say it. Sassy. <laughs> Sassy. Right? More positive or negative? Yes. Okay. We have some general uh, characteristics we're talking about. Submissive. Okay. Next we have black men. Black men. Um, criminals, physically strong, dangerous, athletic, angry, irresponsible fathers, community leaders, attractive, um, that they have sexual prowess, um, they're ministers. That they're ministers. <laughs> that came right after sexual priors. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> and what do you, okay? Any that we would add? Sexual prowess, big penises, yeah. right? Athletic? Baby mamas, baby daddy rather. Yeah. Yeah. Strong. Strong? Yeah. Gangsters? Lazy. Lazy. Not only black these are serious things we've heard. Okay? More positive or negative? Negative, yes. And generally for these groups, black men tend to have the most negative descriptors. And um, clearly what we've been talking about are stereotypes that we don't have to think a whole lot about it, that we clearly can come up with descriptors 
um, to uh, just describing a whole population of people. Clearly, we've not met every Asian, Latino, black, gay, lesbian, but we know all about them, okay? And that, where do these uh, perceptions come from? And they come from what we call exosystemic variables, uh, how you're portrayed in the media. Stereotypes, I'm going through this quickly. Stereotypes um, originally started from journalism and a, a journalist by the name of Walter Lit Lippmann coined the term to describe the way society characterized people, stamping human behaviors with a set of characteristics, making um, from a single set, putting that, single mold rather, putting those characteristics all on one group of people. We stereotype every day. When you walk into this room, and women, you're uh, much more inclined to do it than men, that we start to, like little computers, measure up, OK? You can go to a party and walk in and know whether or not you're underdressed, overdressed, or you fit in. We do it, right? <laughs> in a mess, just like that, OK? Because we've been trained. And we do the same thing with, uh, with race. Now, when we think about stereotypes, there's uh, four general things we can, um, a few things, rather, that we need to know. There's standardized conceptions of people, or uh, of a specific group of people. They're mental cookie cutters. Knock on a door, someone opens the door. OK, you start to um, analyze them. They're also direct expressions of our values. It's not other people, it's how we really think. And when we say it in positive ways, Asians are smart, that's still a stereotype. It's a, called a countertype. And countertypes are merely surface correctives. All stereotypes mm -hmm. are wrong. They're simple, there are four characteristics. They're simple, you free association, you can do it. They're acquired secondhand, vicariously, because you haven't met every single uh, lesbian person, right? Um, they're always wrong and they're very hard to change. And if I could add one, they come on very early. I uh, have, uh, I may have talked about them earlier, two uh, little boys. And uh, I go to get my nails done, stereotypically, uh, to a Vietnamese couple. And uh, they had been asking to see my child. And so I, because uh, I hadn't, you know, was waiting and I hadn't been in there. And I says, oh, I'll bring him in. They says, oh, he's getting old. We want to see the baby. So I had my husband bring the baby in. And he's maybe two, you know. So he brought him in and he sat on it. The, they had a nice little chair for him and little gifts. They were just so excited about him. So you know the routine, ladies. You sit right at the table. She's on the other side and he's sitting next to me. And... He can't take his eyes off of her. He just kept looking at her. And you know a mother's intuition, something bad is getting ready to happen here. <laughs> and he's going to say it, yes. So I'm thinking, just hurry up with this. And he just looks and I says, you know, I guess you're just so pretty that he's just so intrigued with you. And he gets up and gets real close to her. Oh, no and looks, and he's just thinking. I can see the little wheels. You know, if his head was transparent, I could just see it running. So he sits down, and I'm thinking, oh, God, there's going to be something bad. And this is, uh, you know, he's just learning, you know, words, putting sentences together. And, you know, he's, he's not real stable, but he gets up, his little wobbly self. <laughs> Oh my God! I said yes, and I try, and we pride ourselves on being very diverse. Um, you know, I purposely connect them with um, professionals that look like him, but also, you know, in other groups we engage in all kind of church activities with other groups, you know, and his, his teacher, his piano teacher's Korean. I mean, we just try so much. And 
I, the more I tried to get him to shut up, I said, oh, sweetie, that's nice. Sit down. He just got, you know, <laughs> slaughtered. And the entire shop began to laugh and so on. And I, was, I could have just crawled under the table. I was just so embarrassed. And um, I said, I don't know where he got that. And so someone said, does he take karate? And her husband said, no, that's jujitsu jiu that he's doing. So he said, she looks like Mowgli. She's Mowgli. And Mowgli is a um, cat on a um, PBS show where I guess they travel in time or whatever. I don't know why the cat is Asian, <laughs> which is another stereotype. But he had not been taught that at home. But vicariously, he began to associate physical appearance with this behavior. Happens very quickly. Kids learn it very early in life. Now, he didn't do anything like solve a mathematical problem. He did karate or whatever. Stereotypes are so much a part of our society that it's hard to get beyond that when we're thinking about certain groups. And like I said, it starts very early. When we look at TV, uh, what images are given on TV? And we can see primarily men overall are shown on TV. And when we look at races, white, black, Asian, Latino, Native American, and others, what, primarily we see white men. This is just frequency, number of times on TV. Men overall, but primarily white men. Um, and of course, uh, white females. When you look at these groups, Asian, Latino, Native Americans, very rarely. And only recently have we even seen any, but still, very small images. So when you see those limited images and they're portrayed in stereotypical uh, views, then you come to believe she's Vietnamese, she knows karate. Do you know what I mean? She's Vietnamese. This is who, what she is. This is what she does. And I'm, like I said, two years old, just um, does it. And I thank goodness they were very um, nice about it. You know, they didn't. I was offended by it. But they thought it was just funny. And they said he was pretty good, so <laughs> <laughs> I should sign him up for some classes, which I have consequently done. He's pretty good with it. But when children see these images, They've done some research to show that for all uh, races of children, white characters are defined as having very positive characteristics. A minority characters, blacks, Hispanics, so on, are defined as having negative characteristics. And these are from, again, from kids. Now, when we look at gender differences and stereotypes, women still tend to be portrayed in submissive, subservient, inferior, stereotypical roles, OK? So let's look at legitimate media beyond television. <laughs> newspapers. In a survey of 20 newspapers, um, women, even though we make up most of the population, only appeared 13% of the time on the front page. And when they appeared on the front page, the story was about their physical appearance. So when they talked about Hillary Clinton, and at the time this was done, Condoleezza Rice, they talked about how they, their hair. Who cares with their hair? Although Condoleezza could have done something with their hair. <laughs> but, <laughs> which, okay? So it perpetuates. And they're both brilliant women. Okay, even you think about Michelle Obama. She is a brilliant oh, scholar. Goodness. And if I hear one more time about the dress that she wore, you know, so on, that is not who she is. She could be president. But we, said, yeah, okay, but we tend to continue, and that perpetuates all of those myths. And when we think about how these stereotypes are influencing teachers, social workers, nurses, so on, um, physicians, one physician, a uh, colleague of mine who is a physician, very noted physician, said he was in a uh, grand round, and they were discussing a case of um, uh, uh, sexual abuse. And the, the victim had um, 
some venereal disease. And it was a little black girl. And one of the physicians, without hesitation, said, well, the pic I mean, she is 13. You know, she's black. Physician. You know, like that is normal behavior for a kid, you know, by virtue of race. That we, they shouldn't have been surprised, you know, some of those who were surprised. But we carry those uh, stereotypical views to the classroom, and it's reinforced girls, even though they're less likely to be called on in class, because they've been socialized to be right, that you only answer if you know the answer. Okay? Now, that happens. Uh, except in all girls schools. Okay, so there's something for <laughs> gender specific education. Um, girls are more apt to be praised for their appearance and for being neat. Okay, and for all ethnic groups, kids of color tend to be need, in need of rehabilitation, that they're unreceptive to treatment, whereas, um, and that they need some type of intervention, high levels of intervention, because they need to be corrected, fixed, so to speak. And maltreatment for uh, uh, maltreated, uh, neglected kids, poor kids, are seen as sympathetic victims from dysfunctional families. So we have to save them. And in order to save them, we have to remove them from their communities. And for all uh, ethnic minority children, these stereotypical responses are really enhanced high. They are, um, at least in child welfare, they tend to be put in educational tracks that support underachievement, because the assumption is that you cannot achieve, okay? Now, let's see where this stuff comes from. Who are these people here? The Teletubbies. Now, you would know that. You see how fast she did that? Because you probably grew up a little bit with them Teletubbies, no? Okay. Do we know about the Teletubbies? And I have to talk like a Teletubby, because that is how they talk. Okay, let me tell you about Teletubbies. Teletubbies, now whoever did this is absolutely a brilliant uh, child development person because they have them, uh, in fact, this is what, when babies see us, that's what they see when they look at our faces and uh, their motions, their movements, you know, it's, it's very well done. These are little televisions in their, head, in their stomachs or video cameras, I guess you could say, video screens, because they teach a lesson during every episode, so you've got to look at this stomach. And they all have artifacts on top of their heads, signifying something. Uh, this is Tinky Winky. He's a boy. He's about, I would guess, about four or five years of age, based on his motor skills. All of them also carry something, an icon. His icon is a, um, a purse, a pocketbook, a fuchsia pocketbook. This is Dipsy. And this is kind of fuzzy here, but Dipsy is also a male child, or male Teletubby, and he is, he has, um, well, you can see Tinky Winky symbol. Dipsy is, uh, I would say, the, the child of color, because he dances to the Jamaican beat. His face is a little bit darker, and his, he wears a hat, a Mad Hatter's Calypso hat. He's just like, cool, <laughs> okay? Then we have Lala, who is a girl, and she has a curly cue on her head, and uh, Lala uh, has a ball, a big ball that she carries around. And this is the baby of the group, Poe. And Poe likes a little tricycle. She has a tricycle. Okay. When I first began to look at Teletubbies, I thought, this is great, because it's teaching diversity. Okay. This is the guy, the, one of them. I don't, Jerry Farwell came out and said he was gay. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. And there was, you know, kill the Teletubbies or take them off TV or whatever, the simple things. And I, I thought, wow. He carries, a he carries a purse. And he's purple and he, you know. But I thought, you know, this is really teaching inclusion, diversity, and so on. And kids, it's really a program for about six months of age. You can put a kid in front of a TV and watch Teletubbies and they will be glued. Okay. Well, one episode as I was watching... And I had said that long before Jerry Farwell, but I looked at it as a positive thing. How great they're teaching um, acceptance. Well, um, little Tinky Winky has a tutu, a pink tutu, to match his fuchsia purse. And so one day he's dancing. Tinky Winky is dancing with his skirt. 
And along comes Lala. Tinky Winky asks Lala, Lala, you want to play with Skirt? Because that's how they talk. See, I'm going to be an actress. So <laughs> that's, that's um, a desire. So um, Lala says, sure, Lala play with Skirt. So Tinky Winky takes off his skirt, gives it to Lala. Lala puts it on and begins to dance. And they all clap, yay. And they give hugs, big hug to show love and affection. So as they're playing, uh, here comes Poe. And Tinky Winky says to Poe, hey, Poe, you want to play with skirt? And Poe says, yes, Poe like to play with skirt. So Tinky Winky gives Poe the skirt. He puts on the, Poe puts on the skirt, and she does her little dance, <laughs> OK? And they all clap, yay, Poe. Big hug, and they all hug because they're just so happy. Next scene, here comes Brother Man. <laughs> he comes up with his little Calypso hat, you know. And so Tinky Winky says to Dipsy, Dipsy, you want to play with Skirt? Dipsy says, no, Dipsy no play with Skirt. And Dipsy runs down the hill. What has that taught a six-month-old who's glued to the TV? Right? Right. Very subliminal, but long-lasting, right? Beginning with infants, what is acceptable? Hmm? What did she say? I'm sorry. The boys don't wear skirts. It's, ten, it's teaching indirectly gender acceptable behavior, OK? That by virtue of your gender, certain behaviors are acceptable and others aren't. Gender is socially defined, not biologically defined. But we want to make sure that we know children know what's accepted or not. And I often wonder whether or not the creators of, uh, Tink, of Tinky Winky, of the Teletubbies, realized that for that particular episode, because I thought they were progressive. Nonetheless, it shows the impact of television and media in very friendly ways, cartoons that put ideas in our head about uh, stereotypes. Now, who is this? Mufasa from The Lion King. Mufasa is the king, right? Mufasa, is he good or bad? He's good, he's wise, right? And all knowing. Who's that? Scar. And Scar is Mufasa's brother. Good lion, bad lion. Good lion, bad lion, right? See it? Yes, 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 yes. And he even has a little bit of a cool flair to him, Scar. Uh, he like picks his teeth, you know, like, um, Scar's a brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very, you know, he has, his mane is dark and so on, wherever Mufasa. Now, doesn't stop there. Nala is Mufasa's daughter. She's a good lion, that Nala. Sarabi, who is Scar's woman. Because Mufasa and his, they're married. But you know, <laughs> Scar, he just got him a woman. <laughs> right? They never mentioned that they're married. Right? Right. Good lion, blonde and blue, bad lion. Well, she is. Right? How soft and gentle and pretty she is versus these sharp. No, <laughs> yeah. And she needs an orthodontist, yes. OK. The hyenas. And there was a lot of, actually a lot of protests when uh, uh, Lion King came out. Because they, Whoopi Goldberg is one of them. I think she was the head hyena. But they had um, stereotypical voices. I don't know how else to say it. OK. And they were bad, because they wanted to kill Mufasa and take over the world with um, 
uh, a scar. So when we think about stereotypes, this is what I want everyone to remember when you leave here today. All African American, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, and poor families are not the same, although we tend to have those ideas. Variances within each culture is obvious. However, it's human nature. You're not that we're a bad person. And it's difficult to separate this because we have a cultural bias, not only to our own culture, but the dominant culture. Okay. Now, let's review stereotypes of Asian Americans, which my son has clearly already learned this. They're unscrupulously crafty and devious in business. They never speak English. English is always their second language. The women are exotic and the men are intelligent. Hispanics, amorous behavior is fundamental to their human essence. Okay. English also is never their primary language. And there's something as a feminine mystique. When you look at TV, uh, movies, Hispanic women are generally portrayed as either wives or mothers. Um, and Hispanic men all are gangbangers. Um, they ride low riders or they're Scarface and so on. Now Scarface, that movie, has done more to harm the image of uh, Hispanic Americans than anything I can think of because people identify. I mean, who was the guy who was, uh, who was his name? Hmm? Yeah, but what was his name? Al Pacino, but what was his name in the movie? I can't think right now. Tony Montana, yes. I mean, kids, you see kids walking around with his t with a picture of this character, a fictional character. Okay, and these are um, images that, right? So true, right? That we just, we characterize people. Um, you know, all Germans certainly are apparently related to Hitler in some way because they look like him. African Americans, Italians, all Irish are drunks. Now our understanding of Native Americans, they say, came from uh, visual images of the Indian head nickel that we began to associate that this is what it meant to be Native American. And we continue some of these prejudices uh, and stereotypes today. These are um, depictions on uh, pop or soda, uh, you all call it soda here? Pop. Okay, so good, you're with us. So pop, because everyone doesn't call it pop. Here, now, this is very derogatory because this is someone who is of high spiritual esteem. So we wouldn't put uh, a pope, the pope, or a priest, or a pastor on a, uh, to advertise pop. We still continue to use them in uh, mascots. Some states are outlawing that, the use of uh, mascots. And even in, quote, yes, isn't it? <laughs> okay, it's just incredible. Now, that's African Americans. These are all pictures of things that I've picked up, so it's not like, you know, none of the antiques. These are things that I have found in my travels. Um, you remember that particular cartoon? Yes. <laughs> And even in black publications, this is from Emerge Magazine, the comedic male, and even the devil himself is a black man. Okay. Or he might be Hispanic, <laughs> one or the other. Okay. To sell wine. And uh, people revere uh, our cultural icons. This is Bill Cosby. I'm telling you, they're young enough. Hey, you have a baby when you're 12, your baby tur turns 13 and has a baby. How old are you? They're high, this is coffee I spilled. High school dropouts <laughs> or felons, all of them, they can't speak proper English and they have filthy mouths. That's what we're saying about our, our kids, okay? And these are images that many of our elders have grown up looking at. Um, look, Lux won't shrink wool. I can't buy Lux today. Okay, and I'm still not figuring out is that's male, female. Uh, I assume that it's a, some type of human being. But these images, Aunt Jemima, they've cleaned her up a little bit, but she's still very typically, stereotypically viewed. Pillsbury. And now, Hispanic and Latino. 
I've never seen any gentleman walking down the street that looks like this. However, <laughs> I mean, that's what we think of when we think of Hispanic men. And of course, um, the Taco Bell dog, that someone probably should have sued Taco Bell for... Uh, they did. Did they? That's Good. The, yes. And he's still around. They keep getting, the dog dies and they get another one. And of course, Speedy Gonzales, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. And that's what they did. That's the trick. Present it in a cute way, but it embeds in us very stereotypical <laughs> views. And of course, we have Asian Americans, right? This is what my child believed. Okay. Now, any questions? Now let's think about, for a moment, we have about a half hour left to go. I want to give you an exam again. And this exam, when you, th when you begin to see these images, and you can look at TV now, and uh, my husband always says, you've ruined uh, movies for me on <laughs> TV, because now every time I look, I'm examining it. But it exists today. And the trick is you can teach children ways to eradicate stereotypical views. You can't, you know, it's impossible to, to keep them from all of the media images. But when you begin to talk to them, what does that mean? That they learn very early on. Now, one of my, the other kid, said to me one day, um, and I'm very concerned, because, but we're Disney freaks, and Disney has such poor imagery uh, for girls and minorities. But he says to me, you know, Tigger is a lion. I said, yes. He says, well, why do they only say that he can jump? He's king of the jungle. He can do more. And I said, that's right, sweetheart. So he's begun to process that stereotypical response. What do tiggers do best? They jump. That's what you don't know about Tigger? Tigger's a little lion. No, tiger. But they call him, yeah, he's a little tiger, but they call him Tigger. Yeah. Oh, you Winnie, the like Winnie the Pooh. Oh, well, Winnie, Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, yes. And they all do something, and they say, what do tiggers do? do? And he says it. They jump. That's what they do best. Because of my involvement with him, he's determined that that's not all that they can do. That he, you can move beyond the stereotype because he, if he's a tiger, lion, he's the head of the jungle. Okay, and that's the way that we have to move towards uh, eradicating stereotypes. That we really have to train children in the way that support negates negative stereotype images. Okay, now we know. Let's just talk about African Americans for a moment. We know the psychological, the physical effects of marginalization, disempowerment, racism. But what are the psychological effects of these stereotypical views? Discrimination. Okay, now this is an example we can talk about sexism, classism, racism. Right now let's look at uh, for African Americans. And I want you to, we've already talked about my offer this morning. I'm going to give you a little test. It's called the NAD scale. Okay? How much do you agree with this on a scale of 1 to 10? Blacks are born with greater sexual desire than white people. That's good. Mm -hmm. Racial differences <laughs> explain why blacks don't live as long as whites. Without the, take out the police, is that what you're saying? I'll never get out of Oakland alive. Okay. Differences in inheritance is a main reason why blacks and whites should remain separated. Mm -hmm. Don't think too much, because then you'll, you'll, you'll social work it. Blacks are born with greater physical strength and endurance than whites.
When it comes to figures and figuring, blacks seldom measure up to whites. Mathematical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whites are superior to blacks. Okay. Okay. Racial differences explain why Europeans are technologically more advanced than Africans. Genetic inferiority explains why more blacks than whites drop out of school. The school dropout problem among blacks is due to their not having the mental power of whites. Blacks are born with more musical talent than whites. The answer is so scared. The black race is mentally unable to contribute more to America's progress. Blacks are just as smart as whites. The high percentage of blacks in jail reflects inborn tendencies towards criminality. Whites are better at reasoning than blacks. Black people are born with greater rhythm than white people. <laughs> the inborn physical ability of blacks makes it hard to beat them in athletics. Racism is an important factor in explaining why whites have succeeded more than blacks. Mm. The high incidence of crime among blacks reflects a genetic abnormality. And the last couple ones. Black men are better at sex than white men. I did this once and some lady said, yes, Lord. <laughs> The black man's body is more skillful than his mind. The large number of blacks addicted to hard drugs suggest a form of biological weakness. And finally, black women are more sexually open and willing than white women. That uh, scale measures the degree to which you're culturally alienated, the degree to which you internalize racism. There are two basic assumptions that define racism. Okay. Racism is not much more complex than hate. Okay, it's not that easy. Racism, you have to believe two things. One, racism about blacks, I should preface. Blacks are physically gifted, sexually and athletically. Right? Or blacks are intellectually defective cognitively and morally. See? That's what racism is about. Physical giftedness and cognitive defectiveness. Can you see the connection if you're black and you believe that? Right? You internalize racism. That previous scale is called the NAD scale. It's short for natanolatization. How many of you know what natanola cream? No, please. Natanola is a skin cream that was marketed to bleach black skins white. And they still sell it. <laughs> now, then there's, uh, you go into, I don't know here again, I can only reference uh, back there. We have ethnic sections in the drugstore. Yes, and in the ethnic section, you will, have, you will see uh, cosmetics, skin tone creams. They've cleaned them up, but the original design was to bleach black skins white. Uh, Natanola, black and white, I think they have one. Posner's, Am well, Ambi might be new. Posner's, I've seen that. yes, but that's, magazine. yes. Those are originally uh, they were manufactured for the purpose and marketed for the purpose to make your skin white. Mm. Now, because we know the effects of, we already went over that, cultural alienation and dis spiritual, excuse me, disorientation, so sorry. 
that when we measure people on the natanolatization scale, we ask them, is this your reality? What do you suppose people are, who are spiritually disintegrated say? Who gets most angry about that picture? Young ones too. <laughs> you just trying to save yourself, dear, but that's right. No, I remember my grandmother not letting us put the black Jesus with locks up now. Yes. Oh, really? The oh, Irma. Okay. Black church people get upset about this more. <laughs> yes. A and E church. Huh? A and E. That yes, <laughs> yes, church. Yes. Depending on the circle, get very angry. There was a cover in a magazine, on um, Time magazine, they had uncovered a uh, painting by one of the great artists, and it was a picture of the Madonna, and they had her depicted as an African person, and whatever museum in New York um, was incensed, and they did not want that to be displayed in uh, the museum. So it was, and it wasn't just the um, opponents were not all people who were white. There were black people who were opposing it. Now, whatever our belief systems are, if we go back to that whole idea of spiritual disorientation, we have to understand the impact of if this, if you cannot conceive this, how you become spiritually disoriented and how you become self-defeating. If your self-perception is outside of your understanding or your belief about the universe, the possibilities, how you're connected, you're doomed for failure. And one of the ways to uh, understand this from a therapeutic or intervention strategy is that we have to eradicate stereotypes not only from people who are outside of the culture, but people who are within the culture, right? And we have to eradicate stereotypes about women. Women internalize a lot of stereotypes. When did the word bitch become a term of endearment? Huh? Yes, you woke up and it was just, you went to bed one night, woke up and it was, yes. That now you hear it all the time. And by a media that is largely controlled by wealthy white men, that they said that this is acceptable for people to refer to each other as bitch. And sometimes they say, with a B arch, what is this? Right? It's not just by happenstance, it's purposeful. Because when you begin to take away the psychological self of a group of people, you have control. Okay. Now, in order to um, eradicate that, because imagery is so important, and many of our practices and our philosophies, while we say one thing, we clearly do others. Uh, for instance, we have perceptions about the capacity of people based upon race, class, and gender. Without even uh, evaluating, assessing, we come to these assumptions, pre-assumptions, just by reading demographics. That's why I said, why do we need to keep demographics? Because as soon as you see Latina mother, single, 25, six kids, she's going to have some problems, right? It's how we do. Okay. It's important for us to understand a phenomenon in the United States um, that a researcher or social worker by the name of Peggy McIntosh wrote. Um, they said, people always ask, well, why did we talk about uh, cultural com uh, competency. Why do we have to talk about racism? Um, 
I'm not racist. Well, like I said, racism is much, racism is much more complex than just feelings or emotion. It's ingrained in the fabric of society, just like sexism is ingrained in the fabric of society. And there's something known as white privilege, that if you don't, um, while you may not individually participate in the marginalization, society is built and structured in a way that you benefit from it, that you don't have to act, about it, or act on it. And I've made copies for everyone, uh, it's a classical piece of literature, and I would suggest everyone read it. Peggy McIntosh, and she talks about unveiling the invisible uh, knapsack, unpacking the invisible knapsack, uh, white privilege. So we can pass that around. Yes, it's great, great. And to end the discussion, uh, and I don't have my music. I usually play the song, say it loud, I am black and I am proud. <laughs> but <laughs> in my quest to get here on the, on the uh, playing. I didn't bring it, but we start working. Somebody can sing it for us. We start working with children by structuring our environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, while we can't control what other fees to us, we can certainly control how we interpret that, and we can control our own environment. So we begin to look at By the way, I love that picture. Yes, so. positive images. Okay, this is what we, um, what we all should leave here today. Whatever system you come from, orientation, ask yourself, what practices and policies support stereotypical responses, biased assessments, and consequently contribute to disparity and disproportionality? Look at your policies and your practices. If you send, say, if you're a field worker, community-based worker, and you only send people out in the community that are this, look like the same people, you're like, well, that's a black neighbor, so, so we send black people. Yes, yes. Or I remember when I was a field worker, a probation officer, supervisor came to me and said, um, could you go with Mindy? Mindy was uh, uh, a white lady about this tall. Can, can you go with her? Well, why? I got my own case left. <laughs> okay, assumption was I could protect Mindy. Well, there's violence. I need protection too, right? Those kinds of things. Um, look at who does your initial assessments. Uh, in child welfare, we call it intake, child protective service. But who does your general intake? If you're general, who determines who comes into the service? If it's not diverse, you have a problem, okay? Or if your staff, uh, haven't been schooled in diversity and cultural competence. Um, if you're determining safety or risk, whatever you do, that if it's not from a culturally uh, specific standpoint, you have a problem. Things uh, such as whatever activities, child welfare would be removal or determining custody. If we put in stereotypical assumptions, that's what feeds disparity and disproportionality. And certainly, um, for us, for in child welfare adoption rates by race, if uh, we're not looking at culturally uh, sensitive, uh, stereotypical, er eradicating stereotypical responses, all of those things that, quote, um, result in failure or negative outcomes for children will just increase. Okay. Cultural competence is very complex. It's a journey. It's not just a one-way trip. But I would argue that if we begin to really examine our stereotypes, that we're clearly on the path to healing. I'm going to end with just a couple pictures. And I think our reverend knows the song, Say It Loud, Ain't Black and Ain't Proud. And, uh, <laughs> but these are images that we show um, to our children. I wish I had my thing, because I can almost hear with your bad self. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, back, yes. This is Leontine Price. Isn't she beautiful? This is um, some of the people that work with me. These are Somali, Somalian refugees. This is me, yes. Yeah, with my Somali stuff, you know. Uh, and we gave them a welcoming. Um, 
uh, party, I forgot the, Swa the Somali term for it, but invited them and they uh, embraces his family. This is the image that represents family. Yes! Who did it? Uh, Go ahead. Turn it up. Wait. <laughs> no, these are just pictures of them. I love them. Jackie. And I'll end with oh, that's it. Thank you so much. So let's go out and dedicate. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See, I got you right out on time. Yeah. I think that's the end of it.